Dan Brown's blockbuster novel combined with his subsequent hit movie, Da Vinci Code, both dramatically resurrected public fascination with the grail mysteries and the secrets of Mary Magdalene, as well as ancient goddess theologies. What exactly was the Holy Grail? Was it perhaps as tradition would have it, the chalice from which Jesus served the wine at the Last Supper, and which also caught his blood at the crucifixion? Or was the grail chalice a metaphor, hiding the astounding secret that Jesus was by no means celibate, and in fact his holy blood was secretly preserved through future generations, beginning with the child he may have sired with his companion, Mary Magdalene? Or, in an even broader context, could the grail mysteries be metaphors for the divine Sophia, ancient lost goddess theologies that revered the feminine aspect of deity? The book entitled Not in His Image by John Lash offers a brilliant, in-depth study of the lost goddess ideologies. Within this body of formidable research, Lash reveals an alternative account of Old Testament history that suggests the Holy Bible may in fact be a chronicle of ancient extraterrestrial intrusion and intervention in human development. Was the human race actually subdued by extraterrestrial invaders masquerading as deity during the days of Abraham in the book of Genesis? What could lost pagan goddess religions and theologies of remote antiquity possibly have to do with the modern mystery of UFOs? Perhaps more than we might ever dare to imagine. In 1945, an earthenware jar was dug up in a cave west of the Nile near the village of Nag Hammadi, Egypt. Contained in this jar were papyrus scrolls and codices wrapped in leather of biblical texts dating back to around 400 AD. Translations of these Nag Hammadi scrolls revealed a body of early Christian teachings that are considered to be Gnostic in character. In other words, these documents contained Gospels that had escaped censorship or revision by the Church of Rome. Unedited Gospels that in fact repudiated the authority of Orthodox Christian doctrine, posing a theological threat which clearly provided an imperative to keep them hidden from Roman clergy. Gnostic thought insisted upon direct and personal first-hand religious or mystical experience with deity and vehemently rejected dogmas, creeds, and clerics, or any superfluous intercessors between man and God, an unwelcome posture for Vatican authority. In both the Middle East and South America, Gnostic shamanic adepts traditionally understood that ingesting certain psychoactive plants facilitated connection to the epinoia, the luminous, hyperintelligence of the earth itself. A 2,000 year old chronicle of data obtained by this method of communication with the earth's consciousness was unearthed in Nag Hammadi, Egypt in 1945. And what follows is Sophia's story. The Nag Hammadi texts reveal a cosmic understanding that the brilliant light plasma at the central core of our galaxy is actually a sentient intelligence. Furthermore, Gnostic cosmology tells us the physical world we inhabit came into form as a creative expression of the intelligent plasma light or ether spiraling out from the galactic central sun from the spinning planets of our solar system down to the myriad species that flourish on our globe. Even the smallest microbe exists as the creative play of material form imagined and sustained by this sentient light. The Gnostic perception tells us that just as a biologist sees minute living creatures swarming in a drop of water through a microscope, the swirling galaxies seen through an astronomer's telescope are also living beings. The entire universe is a vast living consciousness with individualized nodes of living consciousness existing within it. In the most simplistic terms, the central sun of our particular galaxy is a living entity, intelligent light plasma. 
The arms that extend and swirl out from that central sun are like children of that core awareness. These plasma extensions reach out to the periphery of the galaxy where solid matter is formed, and this is where the play of material creation is acted out. These conscious extensions stretch out and form solid worlds and living beings in infinite variety to express their own individual dream of creativity. Planet Earth first originated as a metamorphosis of an intelligent stream of light plasma extending from the central sun. That stream of light was Sophia, a feminine emanation. Impulsive Sophia was so enraptured by her dream of creation that she plunged into the realm of physical matter alone, without her balancing male consort. In doing so, an accidental aberration occurred. Within Sophia's dream of creation was an ideal intention for living, intelligent creatures that would become humans. For that intention to properly manifest, it needed to blend with organic matter. However, in her brash impulsive plunge, the sheer force of plasma outpouring impacted with inorganic matter, creating an aberrant species that could never properly manifest Sophia's vision for the human species. A portion of the original intention of Sophia's dream did successfully blend with organic matter, and proper humans came into being. Yet they were now challenged to confrontation with their aberrant cousins, who feed off the human life force. Ultimately, Sophia not only formed the Earth from her dream, she actually became Earth. By Gnostic reckoning, Sophia literally morphed into the living planet herself. Earth is Sophia. In other words, Earth is the living mother of all humanity. On May 10, 1971, the noted British astrophysicist and astronomer, Sir Fred Hoyle, called a news conference and made the following startling announcement. Human beings are simply pawns in a great game being played by alien minds which control mankind's every move. These alien minds come from another universe, one with five dimensions. These super-intelligent entities are so different from us that to apprehend them or to describe them in human terms is impossible. They have been here for countless eons and they have probably controlled the evolution of Homo sapiens. All of what man has built and become was accomplished because of the tinkering of these intelligent forces. These lost Gnostic Gospels, however, contain more than Sophia's creation myth. They reveal an exotic description of alien interference with the human species that serious religious scholars dismiss as mythological science fiction, a fantastic and disturbing description of cosmology that exposes an intrusion upon Earth humanity by malevolent, parasitic, extraterrestrial invaders who use Earth humans as puppets in a vast, centuries-old game of deception and domination. And how do the Gnostics describe these invaders? Referred to as Archons, they come in two distinct types, an aggressive reptilian humanoid and smaller, passive creatures resembling a prematurely formed fetus. The astounding research into Gnostic mystery teachings by author John Lash in his extraordinary book, Not in His Image, may hold the key to unlocking the riddle of ancient extraterrestrial interaction and interference with human evolution. Bizarre as it may seem, a solution to the most baffling enigma of our time was fully elucidated in sacred writings almost 2,000 years ago. In the matter of the E.T. UFO enigma, the Gnostics were ahead of everyone today, way ahead. The Nag Hammadi material contains reports of visionary experiences of the initiates, including first-hand encounters with inorganic beings called Archons, beings that emerged in the solar system prior to the formation of Earth. 
Over time, an aggressive, masculine, reptilian leader, not unlike the biblical Satan, emerged. Arrogant by nature, this demiurge deems himself to be at the center of creation, lord of all he beholds. Gnostic texts state plainly that Demiurge is insane, a demented god or impostor deity, and he works against humanity. Gnostics warn that we coexist in a planetary system with a demented entity who can access our world through our minds. The Demiurge of the Old Testament is an arrogant pretender who claims that humans are made in his image. These four words are the corporate motto of patriarchy. Branded on the human soul, made in his image, signifies the total enslavement of humanity to an alien, off-planet agenda. Gnostics taught that these entities envy us and feed on our fear. Above all, they attempt to keep us from claiming and evolving our inner light the gift of divine intelligence within. Archons are an alien force that intrudes subliminally upon the human mind and deviates our intelligence away from its proper and sane applications. They make us play out our inhumane behavior to weird and violent extremes. Archons are psycho-spiritual parasites. Gnostics detected the humanized face of the Archons in all authoritarian structures and systems that deny authenticity and self-determination to the individual. According to Gnostic perception, Jesus, if mortal at all, had been a prophet of Amor, the principle of love, and Amor, when inverted or perverted into power, became Roma, Rome whose opulent, luxurious church seemed to the Gnostics a palpable embodiment and manifestation on earth of Rex Mundi's sovereignty, Rex Mundi being the archon lord of the material world. As such, Gnostics came to regard the Christian cross as the emblem of Rex Mundi, an icon of domination and control. Threatened by the growing popularity of these Gnostic ideas, Pope Innocent III launched a holy war in 1209 to eradicate such poisonous heresies. Whole populations were put to the sword in southern France in the Albigensian Crusade, which lasted for decades. This deadly campaign also spawned the murderous Inquisition, designed to ruthlessly exterminate any and all beliefs that challenged papal authority. This crusade was so successful that suppression of these Gnostic teachings has lasted until modern times, certainly a suspicious indication of Archon manipulation. The roots of Gnosticism reach far back to the mystery schools of ancient Egypt, yet halfway around the world awareness of the Archons could be traced to the mystic seers of ancient Mexico as well. Consider these insights shared by Yaqui Indian shaman Juan Matis from Carlos Castaneda's book, The Active Side of Infinity. We have a predator that came from the depths of the cosmos and took over the rule of our lives. Human beings are its prisoners. The predator is our lord and master. It has rendered us docile, helpless. If we want to protest, it suppresses our protest. If we want to act independently, it demands that we don't do so. Indeed, we are held prisoner. They took us over because we are food to them, and they squeeze us mercilessly because we are their sustenance. 
Sorcerers believe the predators have given us our systems of belief, our ideas of good and evil, our social mores. They are the ones who set up our dreams of success or failure. They have given us covetousness, greed, and cowardice. In order to keep us obedient, meek, and weak, the predators engaged a stupendous maneuver. Stupendous, of course, from the point of view of a fighting strategist. A horrendous maneuver from the point of view of those who suffer it. They gave us their mind. The predator's mind is baroque, contradictory, morose, filled with fear of being discovered any minute now. Sorcerers of ancient Mexico reasoned that man must have been a complete being at one point, with stupendous insights, feats of awareness that are mythological legends nowadays. And then everything seems to disappear, and we have now a sedated man. What I am saying is that what we have against us is not a simple predator. It is very smart and organized. It follows a methodical system to render us useless. Man, the magical being that he is destined to be, is no longer magical. He's an average piece of meat. Is it conceivable that humans could naturally evolve into a malignant species toxic to their own fragile environment, unable to coexist in harmony with the myriad complexities of this planet's ecosystems? Does the fact that 250 genomes within human DNA are not indigenous to this planet suggest humans actually don't belong here? or? Has Homo sapiens been genetically manipulated to be alien to its home world? Or worse, have humans been genetically manipulated to be alien unto themselves? Can it be denied that humans have been specifically engineered to serve the agenda of someone or something beyond the scope of their senses that secretly rules their lives? In George Andrews' classic book, Extraterrestrial Friends and Foes, aliens themselves explain just how a massive, covert invasion of planet Earth could be successfully perpetrated. If you were a highly advanced culture about to invade a relatively primitive culture, you would not do it with a flourish of ships showing up in the heavens and take risk of being fired upon. That's the type of warfare less evolved mortals would get into. You would begin by creating intense confusion with only inferences of your presence, inferences which cause controversial disagreement. You would make yourselves known to various elite in-groups who would offer you protection out of greed, expecting to acquire more perfect knowledge than anyone else on the planet of this ultimate secret to end all secrets. They would covet you and you would trust their covetousness and their crass stupidity to trap them. You would go to the most secret and powerful organizations within the society, and through use of techniques unknown to them, you would take over some of their key people in their innermost core group. You would occasionally let your ships be seen by some of the ordinary citizens, so that the elite government groups would become involved in attempts to keep them quiet, clumsily squelching attempts to make information about UFO activity public. This would result in the mass population losing confidence in the veracity of their elected officials. There would be constant arguments between the authorities and the public as to whether or not the persistently reported phenomena genuinely existed, thereby setting the population and the government at each other's throats. By subtly causing economic turmoil, you would set the haves and the have-nots at each other's throats. In all possible ways, you would plant the seeds of massive discontent. After you had manipulated the population to the point where your covert control over it was complete, you might decide to go overt and let a few ships land in public. But you would not go from covert to overt until you were sure of the totality of your control. Humanity is not about to be invaded. 
Humanity is not in the middle of an invasion. Humanity has been invaded, and the invasion is nearly in its final stages. Great invasions do not happen with thundering smoke and nuclear weaponry. That is the mark of an immature society. Great invasions happen in secrecy. What I want to get across to you is the ultimate evil, which underlies all the negativity in the cosmos, finds expression in that masked form of psychological complacency that leads an individual to adhere to a group philosophy rather than to think things through for oneself. Those who feel safe and comfortable in no matter what belief system, merely because many others adhere to it, who get together and form an arrogant, self-righteous group, convinced it has a monopoly on the truth, and who are ready to persecute, kill, or stifle anyone who challenges that group's philosophy, have formed an alliance with the ultimate evil, whether they know it or not. As soon as you become involved in a belief system that you are a chosen special group who are lords over the common folk because of your secret knowledge, you are on your way to a fall. That type of attitude plants the seeds of destruction in any society or culture, leaving it vulnerable to overthrow by those oppressed within its boundaries as well as by outside forces. All cultures who have elite power groups at odds with each other and with the population at large sooner or later collapse from either internal or external pressures. The only chance of retaining your freedom is for the awareness of this principle to penetrate the consciousness of humanity. It is a pearl of wisdom treasured by those who have attained the ability to travel through time and other life cycles. The unremitting governmental policy of denial regarding extraterrestrials suggests compliance and collusion with these entities at the highest official levels. Widespread abductions, cattle mutilations, and UFO sightings combined with a dangerous drift toward a one world order suspiciously reveals the alien agenda. In his book, The Day After Roswell, Retired Army Colonel Philip Corso, former National Security Advisor to President Eisenhower, stated, We were convinced that whoever the UFO extraterrestrials were, they were tampering with our planet, operating with impudence, and manipulating us constantly and secretly. But it was a secret that had our full compliance, because we were unwilling to admit the truth and fight the war. Those of us in the military who knew what was happening, also felt that we could be experiencing an invasion that was more of an infiltration. They were compromising our very systems of defense and government. As long as we were incapable of defending ourselves, we had to allow the ETs to intrude as they wished. We had negotiated a kind of surrender with them as long as we couldn't fight them. They dictated the terms because they knew what we most feared was disclosure. Hide the truth and the truth becomes your enemy. Disclose the truth, and it becomes your weapon. We hid the truth, and the extraterrestrials used it against us. The first step to liberation from this alien control is to unmask the deception. The Gnostics fully understood this truth 3,600 years ago. The stupendous success of this alien invasion has been its ability to function in absolute secrecy and seduce the human mind with artificial systems of belief to convince us that we live our lives at the mercy of circumstances and events that exist outside of ourselves. For centuries this belief, like an insidious mantra, has been drilled relentlessly into our psyches from the cradle to the grave. We have been duped into seeing ourselves as victims, and so we become victims. The Gnostics remind us that the world we see today does not show the face of true human, but rather the insane homicidal face of the manipulating Archon madness that distorts it. Perhaps humanity now confronts its ultimate destiny, to awaken from this artificially induced nightmare and reclaim the divine power within that has always been our true cosmic birthright. Humanity now has the opportunity to rid itself of these other dimensional extraterrestrial parasites, 
and ever increasingly widespread realization of the true nature of this predatory game is what will bring about liberation. The matrix is everywhere. It is all around us, even now in this very room. You can see it when you look out your window, or when you turn on your television. You can feel it when you go to work, when you go to church, when you pay your taxes. It is the world that has been pulled over your eyes to blind you from the truth. That you are a slave. Like everyone else, you were born into bondage. Born into a prison that you cannot smell, or taste, or touch a prison for your mind. Ancient Gnostic perceptions appear to be far more than charming antiquated mythologies. They bear striking significance to the modern UFO and alien abduction scenarios. Gnostic adepts had gained a keen understanding of how hyperdimensional entities could access our world and influence human activities. As well, reality as we perceive it may be in fact an artificial containment, a virtual reality where human existence serves unseen masters. The notorious gray aliens seem to be more than just curious space visitors. Whistleblower Robert Lazar, a physicist employed at Area 51, revealed in 1989 classified information suggesting the Greys have had a long-standing proprietary interest in the human species. These beings said that they had been visiting Earth for a long time and presented photographic evidence which they contended was over 10,000 years old. These beings conveyed information about the capability of affecting the human brain to anesthetize the human body. This is done without any physical contact from a remote source. For this anesthesia to be accomplished, the brain has to be in a relaxed state similar to that required for hypnosis. If the brain is subject to any external stimulation, like stimulant drugs or loud music, this manipulation of the nervous system is ineffective. These beings said that man was the product of externally corrected evolution. They said that man as a species had been genetically altered 65 times. They referred to humans as containers, yet I don't know what we are containers of. Lazar went on to state, There is an extremely classified document dealing with religion. It says that we are containers. That's supposedly how the aliens look at us, that we're nothing but containers. Maybe containers of souls. You can come up with whatever theory you want, but we are containers and that's how we're mentioned in the documents. That religion was specifically created, so we have some rules and regulations for the sole purpose of not damaging the containers. Again referencing the book Extraterrestrial Friends and Foes, author George C. Andrews tells us, One of the allegations concerning the short grays is that they have a way of deriving nourishment from what leaves our bodies, containers, at the moment of death, that they are eaters of souls, who extract from our spirits a certain principle, through a process comparable to the extraction of hemoglobin from blood, which they use as food. Separation of the etheric body from the soul can also be brought about by malignant entities for predatory purposes, both during life and upon passing the frontiers of death. The etheric body is charged with energy that is neither as subtle as that of the soul nor as coarse as that of the physical body, but is intermediate between them. This substance is highly valued as nourishment by certain other life forms which include the greys. This is what the greys are after, 
which they are here to trap as we trap fur-bearing animals. We are now and have for a millennia been used by the greys as a food source, with almost zero awareness of the actual situation. However, the continued survival of the greys on Earth depends on our continued ignorance of this symbiotic relationship, in which the benefits are all strictly one way. The greys are other dimensional predatory parasites who have been manipulating us as we manipulate cattle since time immemorial. Their hypnotic control over us is so complete that hardly anyone even begins to realize that they actually exist. Philosopher Daniel Pinchbeck describes the plight of the greys in his text, 2012 The Return of Quetzalcoatl. Like dusty insects attracted to flame, the greys yearn for our qualities of soul warmth. Despite their cunning and technological acumen, these qualities remain beyond them. They are intelligent and sentient, hence aware of their exiled status. Unable to escape their de-souled condition, they desire to draw humans into their lower world, sustaining their half-lives on our subtle energies. They appear to be utilizing their dream world technologies in a serious and desperate attempt to find a way out of their cul-de-sac. Dr. Jacques Vallée suggests our accepted scientific perception of reality may be very limited and inaccurate. If we look at the world from an informational point of view, and if we consider the many complex ways in which time and space may be structured, the old idea of space travel and interplanetary craft, to which most technologists are still clinging, appears not only obsolete, but ludicrous. Indeed, modern physics has already bypassed it, offering a very different interpretation of what an extraterrestrial system might look like. I believe there is a system around us that transcends time as it transcends space. The system may well be able to locate itself in outer space, but its manifestations are not spacecraft in the ordinary nuts and bolts sense. The UFOs are physical manifestations that cannot be understood apart from their psychic and symbolic reality. What we see in effect here is a control system which acts on humans and uses humans. Researcher Bernard Gunther further defines these hyperdimensional realities by stating, There is more to our reality than our five senses can perceive. We are not God's ultimate creation, nor on the peak of the evolutionary ladder in Darwinian terms. Our reality is embedded in a complex system of unseen worlds and controlled by denizens of higher reality. The forces at work are not all good, and we're not on the top of the food chain. Food does not have to be physical, and these beings feed off our negative emotions and energy, predominantly chaos, sexual pathologies, and fear, which they create working through us. The ancient esoteric teachings talk about a hyper-dimensional matrix control system that has influenced and controlled humanity for millennia, each in their own way. Don Juan, in Castaneda's book, The Active Side of Infinity, called it the topic of all topics. Speaking of a cosmic predator that uses man as food. Man has a glowing coat of awareness, which the predator eats, leaving just the bare minimum of consciousness stuff for man to remain physically alive. The predator milks man through arranging for constant trouble and crisis and senseless preoccupation, so as to generate flashes of awareness that it then proceeds to eat. And one of the most useful constructs in our world that guarantees perpetual crisis and conflict is religion. The late Gore Vidal spoke to the root of this matter. The great unmentionable evil at the center of our culture is monotheism. From a barbaric Bronze Age text known as the Old Testament, three anti-human religions have evolved, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. These are sky god religions. They are literally patriarchal, 
God is the omnipotent Father, hence the loathing of women, for two thousand years in those countries afflicted by the sky god and his earthly male delegates. The sky god is a jealous god, of course. He requires total obedience from everyone on earth, as he is in place not for just one tribe, but for all creation. Those who would reject him must be converted or killed for their own good. Ultimately, totalitarianism is the only sort of politics that can truly serve the sky god's purpose. To guarantee their perpetual human food source, it appears the Archons have established on Earth a matrix control system to manage their livestock. As well, it also appears they have groomed particular dynasties of humans to serve as their terrestrial managers. The human managers possess a very specific psychological profile. There exists a type of human who has no connection to the higher centers of universal love, awareness at birth. He or she is not genetically wired this way, not being able to access them this lifetime around, but he or she can emulate and mimic these higher characteristics quite well, and even distract you from evolving by sapping your energy and feeding off it. He or she can tell you exactly what you want to hear, appear compassionate, empathetic, and understanding without meaning or feeling it. This type of human is the psychopath, making up about 6% of humanity who is hiding behind a mask of sanity, creating misery and chaos which they feed off. They are not necessarily criminals in prison, but can be successful CEOs, politicians, spiritual leaders, a husband, wife, child, or the neighbor next door. They are also pathological liars who never feel any guilt or remorse. That is the topic which is very misunderstood and ignored. Becoming aware of it and educating oneself and others about it is the most crucial and important action we can undertake to make this world a better place. It's the underlying cause of the reason why our world is in the state it's in. It's run by psychopaths. The collective inability to recognize our leaders as psychopaths is in itself pathological. One phenomena all ponderogenic groups and associations have in common is the fact that their members lose, or have already lost, the capacity to perceive pathological individuals as such, interpreting their behavior in fascinated, heroic, or melodramatic ways. When the habits of subconscious selection and substitution of thought data spread to the macro-social level, a society tends to develop contempt for factual criticism and to humiliate anyone sounding an alarm. The general population's inability to discern pathology in their world leaders effectively serves the Archon Matrix Control System. An abductee herself, the late Dr. Carla Turner, warned, Humans have a deep need to believe in the power of good. We need for the aliens to be a good force, since we feel so helpless in their presence. And we need for some superior force to offer us a hope of salvation, both personally and globally, when we consider the sorry state of the world. I think the aliens know this about us. They know that we want and hope for them to be benevolent creatures and they use our desire for goodness to manipulate us. What better way to gain our cooperation than to tell us that the things they are doing are for our own good? Returning to the Gnostic perspective, Goddess Sophia's dream of creation is still a work in progress. John Lash states, Humanity cannot find its way to alignment with Gaia Sophia without mastering the problem of extra-human predation. Whence comes evil? Are we alone? If we cannot get clear on our relation to our cousin species, who are so deeply implicated in the scenario of terrestrial evolution, how can we possibly realize our membership in the cosmic community at large? Finally, Elton Turner, abductee himself and husband to the late Dr. Carla Turner, offers this hopeful reminder. 
Reality left in the hands of the invaders is neither what we need nor what we want. It is time that we think hard about ourselves and what we have on this gem of the universe, our home, our planet. There are laws governing the actions of our invaders, rules guiding their actions and patterns of behavior we can discover if we will make a concerted effort to discern them. We humans have something valuable that is desirable to and usable by the alien forces acting on us. I feel it is time we take back that which is ours, that we use all our resources to discover the laws that govern reality and become the beings that we intrinsically know we are.